Psalm 25, the first five verses. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh, my God, I trust in you. God is looking for a people today who will trust him no matter what's going on. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait. And I believe God wants today to show you and I his ways, his paths, as we wait on him. Let's worship him this morning. Okay, Amen. hallelujah. You will need his microphone in our monitors, please, too. Thank you.
instrumental, just your voices. Go look around, just between you and Jesus. You and Jesus, let's sing it to him. Oh, yeah. Time slow way down the singer at one. Oh, there's no thing better than you, Lord. There's no thing better than you, Lord. There's no thing, nothing is better than you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Sing this part. 
Fill us more and more with your glory. Fill the house, Lord, with your glory. Let it transform our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to sing one more song in worship. And I'm going to ask the ushers to come and hold the buckets. And because of our tables here today, rather than passing the plates, we're going to give you an opportunity during this last song. If you have an offering, you can come and bring it and put it in one of the buckets as we continue our worship. If you have a welcome card to drop off, you can do that as well. So let's make our giving as a part of our worship as we sing this last song.
<coughs> Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I just pray a blessing on all who are gathered here today and those joining us online. God, I just pray for an increase in your work among us. Lord, we yield more and more of our lives to you. Lord, I ask you to touch those who need a touch today, whether it be a healing, whether it be encouragement, whether it be direction, whether it be to be set free from something. Lord, whatever, whatever we need, you are able. You are able. Oh, touch your people today, Lord. Encourage and strengthen, I pray, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you greet some people nearby? I know that this isn't how we're normally set up, of course, on a Sunday. But uh, greet some people nearby. Welcome one another. You may be seated. As you're being seated, again, welcome everybody to Jubilee and those online, welcome. <clears throat> and if you're a guest here today, we're so glad that you came. And as I mentioned, we're not normally set up this way on Sunday mornings. Uh, but we're set up this way today because we're going to be having a meal together after. And if you're available to stay, we'd love to have you stay and eat lunch with us. All right, as you're being seated, if you want to just grab your bulletin, I want to highlight a couple of things. We are beginning tomorrow, tomorrow, a special week of fasting and prayer. One week, starting tomorrow. So you can enjoy your lunch today. <laughs> and then starting tomorrow, week of fasting and prayer. What are we praying for? We're believing God to be able to sell one of the excess portions of land that we have. And we're praying for an increase in the presence and glory of God among us, an increase in miracles. So we are having three different prayer times available in the facility. If you're able to come to any of these, here's the schedule. It's right there. It'll be in the, the fireside room. When you first come in to the foyer area to the left, there's a room there. So it will be there. And every morning, starting tomorrow through Saturday, 6.30 to 7.30 a.m., now, if you're not a morning person, that's fine, but maybe some of you on your way to work or whatever, uh, you don't have to stay for all of it. So that's available, 6.30 to 7.30, Monday through Saturday. Then we have a lunchtime, uh, also 11.30 to 12.30 in that same room. And then each evening from 7 to 8. Now our Wednesday will be in here for prayer, but all the rest of the week in the prayer room. There are some prayer guides in there to kind of help you. If you want to use them, you're welcome to. Now, in terms of the fasting part of it, I just want to encourage you to do whatever God puts on your heart. Maybe it's a meal a day. Maybe it's giving up certain foods that you really like. But whatever it is, just seek God and do whatever he puts on your heart to do. There are a bunch of other announcements. I'm just going to highlight one of them, and that is, and you have an insert on it, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, which is the 9th, at 7 o'clock, we're showing the film, I Am a Victor, and there's an insert uh, regarding that. Kendall Qualls uh, put this together, and if you don't know who he is, you can read more about him there. But we have extra 
inserts out on the kiosk. We'd love to have you give these out and invite others to come. So, want to make you aware of those things. I'm going to ask Becky and Pastor Buddy and Keisha if they would come and Pastor Jim Towner. And uh, Jim's going to pray over the pastors today and share whatever uh, he would like. So, the children can be. But not till after. Well, could I ask the elders to come forward too and stand behind uh, these beautiful couples? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, I'm going to pray. This is Pastor's Appreciation Day. And uh, the Lord has put something on my heart to share with these people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And then we're going we're gonna to bless them. You're going to bless them from where you are. You yeah. extend your hand and bless them. Yeah. And uh, the elders behind will be laying hands on. Uh, the Lord uh, often speaks to me in visions and, and words. And um, I was praying, well, what... what what do you want me to say today here? <laughs> and uh, the Lord showed me that this church is like a masterpiece. It's like a big painting, a big one. And the, the frame around it is beautiful gold. And the frame represents the Lord, who is also the painter. You know, you may not know, some of you who... Uh, memorize scripture, that famous scripture, uh, um, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 8 to 10, which says, for, we have been, for you have been saved uh, 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 by faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any sh anyone should boast. Uh, and you are his masterpiece, <laughs> masterpiece, in other words, it says workmanship, but it's a masterpiece, that's the word in the original language. Uh, that that uh, that he's created, and uh, the the purpose of that masterpiece is to do good works. But you know, I I don't know if you know it, but but when it says you, it's not talking about you individually. It's talking about you, you plural, Amen. you plural. So in every group, there's a you individually, but there's a you in the group. And this is talking about the you as a group. We at Jubilee. And every group that names the name of Jesus, in addition to each one in that group, is a masterpiece. So Jubilee is a masterpiece. And I was praying about that. I said, what, what, uh, what does that have to do with this couple that's, these two couples that are here? Well, in, uh, my wife's a painter and she can correct me, but this is what I, I got. In, in, uh, in a masterpiece, that's a quality, and this Jubilee is a quality masterpiece. Amen. I've been around the block, and I know this church is a masterpiece. It's a quality. You, you have, a, you have a, a structure of the painting, and a, and a, a sketch, and a, everything has to be balanced. And, um, and I'm talking, first of all, about Pastor Mark and Pastor Becky, that uh, God used them many years ago to start a... A structure of a painting that's in order, that's balanced, and that that everything fits together like it should. But you know, a, a so that's 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 mainly Pastor Mark. The structure, you know, a structure that's of God that God put on your heart. That's not going to change. Moreover, you're not going to let it change because uh, that structure God gave you. And then um, what's a painting without color <laughs> so this lady comes along and she she puts these rich colors of quality and she has talent in that and so it's it's not only just a just a black and white sketch and there's it's a beautiful color it's balanced but it's also it also has color in it just think of the masterpieces you may have seen you know the the rich browns and the blues and the sky and and oh you know the masterpiece of of of, of the uh, 
uh, you know, the kind you've seen in the, in, the, in the artists, the masters of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and so, so to speak. Well, that's a wonderful masterpiece. But you know what? <laughs> it ain't for everybody. <laughs> that masterpiece needs a few uh, bold colors in here. Some red. Some, some. And maybe uh, Pastor Becky, the artist, wouldn't have thought of, you know. He needs some new thinking here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> God brings uh, Pastor Buddy and Keisha. Yeah. And uh, Buddy comes with new ideas. Praise the Lord. And <laughs> hallelujah, make this, make this, make this even more uh, attractive. Not attractive to those old folks, but attractive <laughs> to everybody. And then Keisha comes along. She says, I think that this painting needs sound to it. <laughs> and sound and movement, yeah. yeah. They're too dead. <laughs> Not really dead, but they seem dead to some people. So she comes in and, and she, just, she just does it. And so together, this masterpiece, quality, beauty, stability, firmness, but also a new life. Yes. And it's, it has sound and movement to it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Even the masterpiece moves from here to there wherever it needs to go. <laughs> yes. And then together, you know, that masterpiece suddenly becomes three-dimensional. Wow, yeah, yeah. we're looking out here, I see you and you're here, but I see them, they're back there, and that's three dimensional, it's not all flat. And so that's what Jubilee has become. And uh, I, the Lord told me one other thing. There is a great need for courage in you guys. Courage, courage. Go with what God has put on your heart Working together in this masterpiece. This is the masterpiece where God put you. And you're going to, with your gifts and your calling and what you come, you're, and it's become together this three-dimensional thing, which is life. And, and then it has movement. That's life. It's living. And so that requires courage. I'm not going to tell you what you have to be courageous about. If you don't know already, you will know. <laughs> Does that sound right, folks? So I want you to extend your, your hands toward these dear brothers and sisters of ours. Pastors Mark and Becky, Pastor Buddy and Keisha. And uh, elders, go ahead and lay hands on them. Yeah, and just pray. Pray for courage. Pray that they'll flow in their gifts. And you, you folks, too. Pray that for protection. The devil doesn't like this masterpiece. He wants to destroy it. Like, like someone went up to a, a museum and took some, some stuff and just threw it on the paint to destroy it. Well, God doesn't want that to happen to this masterpiece. And so I'm asking you to join together and pray for these pastors right now in Jesus' name. I'm going to pray, and you elders pray together. And all of you where you are, pray for this pastoral team in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless, we bless, we bless these leaders, Lord, in Jesus' name. Pastor Mark and Becky, Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for the, the stability and the courage that this has taken and the, the giftedness and the focusedness, Lord. And I just, am, I just sense that there's going to be need for great courage in these coming days, Lord. They'll take hits. They'll take hits. And church, we need to join together and support them. Praise the Lord and surround them with our love and surround them with our words of affirmation. And God, we just pray in the name of Jesus, you'd bless them, protect them, fill them with your joy.
Fill them with new energy from heaven in Jesus' name. New energy. Do you believe new energy is flowing into them? Just let it flow from Jesus through your hands to this, this couple. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, uh, oh, best buddy and, and Keisha. Oh, God, we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Thank you for the vibrancy and the life they bring, Lord. And the thinking outside of the box in Jesus' name. And uh, I'm telling you, there's a need going to need for courage like you don't even realize coming up. You, if you do, think you have it now, you're going to need more in the coming days. You're going to receive hits. You're going to receive temptations to veer off from one side to the other. Do not do it. Cling to Jesus. Flourish and function where God has put you in the mighty anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you bring a great deal of life to this congregation. God has brought you here. Hallelujah. It's him. It's not you. It's not Pastor Mark. It's the Lord Almighty. And he's put you in this wonderful masterpiece, in this beautiful frame that's, that's, that's the wonderful living color. Hallelujah. Of movement and of joy and of music and everything else. And you're playing a wonderful part. Now be courageous to hear the voice of the Lord, to stay in the spirit of God, to abide in Christ, to set your roots deep down into the love of God, hallelujah, in the joy of the Lord, hallelujah. Let it spread to other people. Let your friendship, let your friendship just be the friendship of Jesus, touching people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for them. And help us as a congregation to, 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 uh, to wrap our arms around them and to, and to affirm them, to support them, and be loyal to them in Jesus' name and to pray for them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like to say just one thing came to me while we were praying. You know, we all appreciate our pastors. We love them. We see them every Sunday, maybe Wednesday. But you know, I, I love them, but I know I don't appreciate them enough because I'm thinking of all the thousands of things that they do that are unknown to any of us. They might be known to their spouses. That's a thousand of little sacrifices that they make that we really don't understand. But I'd really like to encourage us all to pray for them throughout the week. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Jim, and uh, I so love our pastoral staff and our elders, and uh, each of you. You remember, you are a part of that masterpiece. You are a vital part of it. The children may go ahead and be dismissed for kids' church. William and Olga. Is Olga here too? Yes. Why don't you come forward real quick? They're going to be heading out on a trip, and, and Jacob as well. And Olga's also had a, a number of things come up health-wise lately. So uh, let's just pray over them as well. Dave. So um, they had this beautiful gift given to them. And it is a trip to the Holy Land. They were gifted it. And they will be gone, get this, the whole month of November overseas. So I think they we need a chaplain so to go with them right and just, you know, um, just kidding, just kidding. Father, we thank you for this amazing couple and family and their heart for you. And Lord, we're so grateful for this opportunity to go on this trip and for providing the way. And we just uh, pray your uh, blessings upon them that nothing will hinder this trip. Nothing. There's no, nothing the enemy can do to prevent this from happening. We just declare a hedge, a hedge, a hedge of protection around them. And, and we just declare that they're going to be healthy throughout this whole time. Travel will be well. Connections will be well. And, Lord, that while they're in the land you yourself walked, that it's going to be a powerful experience for them, encouragement, 
and just uh, revelation and just a building up. And so we especially pray for Olga, Lord, and we just declare that she's well, she's healthy, she's strong, because you are releasing healing to her. And we just declare the enemy cannot, cannot take any health away, but she will be strong in you. And we just pray covering over them as they go and just bless them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. One other thing that I uh, neglected to mention in the back, there's a table as pastor's appreciation table. There's some couple boxes and I ask you to flip a little thing in there in the, in the, uh, in the boxes to show your appreciation, love uh, for your pastors, maybe a note and maybe a little uh, cash there. So they're back there, please, please be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we've been in a series of messages on the theme, Why a Biblical Worldview Matters. And I've been defining a worldview as how we look at and understand our world and how we respond to the things that we face in life. Our worldview is developed by our exposures, our experiences, our interpretation of those exposures and experiences, and the decisions we make in response. A biblical worldview would be a worldview that is influenced primarily by the scriptures more so than by culture. And a biblical worldview requires that we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and teaches absolute truth. And the reason that that is a biblical worldview is because that's what the Bible teaches, and we looked at evidence of both of those. One of the things that we've been doing in this series is we've been contrasting a biblical worldview from a cultural worldview. In other words, what the Bible says versus what culture says. And have you recognized that the gap is increasing between what the Bible says and what culture says? That gap is getting further and further apart. And my plan is actually to conclude this series uh, this morning. And one of the verses I've been emphasizing in this series is Isaiah 118, which says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Now, to reason together would imply that we have a willingness to acknowledge that something we believe may need adjusting. Some of the way we live may need adjusting. Think about it. If that wasn't the case, what would be the purpose of reasoning together? Reasoning together implies that we might have to make an adjustment along the way. And I hope that you are willing to acknowledge that something you believe, some way you're living may need adjusting. I, I, I believe that would be true in my own life. And then we've also been using... It's kind of a core verse, Colossians 1, verses 4 and 8, where Paul says, Now this I say, lest anyone deceive you with persuasive words. Our culture has been trying to deceive us with persuasive words. So many of our culture, uh, much of our culture has been deceived by persuasive words. And reality is many who profess to be followers of Christ have also been deceived by persuasive words that we are just continually bombarded with. And notice what verse 8 says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. As I mentioned, we are continuously bombarded with some philosophies that are contrary to Christ. And Paul's saying, beware, 
Be on guard. Don't be deceived. Don't give in. And so we've been, again, making these contrasts. And what I want to do today is, is make a few additional contrasts. And I want to start out by looking at this question, what are the basic moral guidelines of Scripture? Now, many of these our culture is standing against. Many of the things God says thou shalt not, our culture says thou shalt. And many of the things where God says thou shalt, our culture is saying thou shalt not. Now, I want to just to kind of set the stage if we're going to be looking at the basic moral guidelines of Scripture, then some of the things I'm going to say are going to be standards that every one of us have broken at some time or another. Now, how should you and I respond when a standard is reviewed that we have at one time or another failed? And really, my answer to that is it just depends on whether or not you've asked forgiveness, whether or not you have repented. Because here's the thing, if a standard is reviewed where I have failed in the past, if I have repented, then actually I should be grateful to hear that standard brought up again. Why? Two things. One is, whenever you and I sin, we eventually experience pain because of that sin. We experience the consequences and we should hope that as others are brought, be, being made aware of those standards, that maybe somebody cannot have to go through what you or I went through. Maybe somebody can avoid the pain if they know that standard and follow it in their lives. So we should never feel shame or condemnation when a standard is reviewed that we may at one time or another violate it again, unless we've not yet dealt with that with God. But here's the other thing. When we hear of standards that at some time in our life we have violated, what it really should do is cause us to be so grateful for the mercy and grace of God. Because if we have been forgiven of those things, then it should just bring us gratitude for that forgiveness. And that that forgiveness is so thorough that the Bible says God remembers it no more. He casts the memory of it away as far as the east is from the west. Therefore, there's no reason to, to beat ourselves up with guilt and condemnation. That's what the enemy would want to do. But what God would want us to do is just to be so grateful <clears throat> for his forgiveness. There are a couple of scriptures I'm going to share before we jump into these moral guidelines. John 14, 15 Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. One of the ways you and I express our love for God is following his guidelines. We express love as we sing and, and worship on Sunday and, and the other days, but it's not just how loud we sing, it's also how straight we walk the rest of the time. So one of the ways we express love is not just feeling a particular emotion, but by walking in alignment with his standards. 2 John 1, 6 says, This is love that we walk according to his commandments. Now, before we jump into these, there's two more verses. These aren't in your notes, so you may want to write them down uh, on the back of your bulletin. Romans 1, 16 and Mark 8, 38. Romans 1, 16 and Mark 8, 38. Sometimes... When we hear about God's standards, if we have been brainwashed by our culture and those standards are reviewed, sometimes we could be offended by God's standards. Offended because our culture is offended. And if we have given in to the philosophies of our culture versus of Christ, we might hear a standard and feel grieved about it. But here's, notice what Paul said in Romans 1.16. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. 
For it is the power of God unto salvation. And a part of the gospel would be the standards that God has given you and I to live by because he knows that following his ways will cause life to work far better. So you and I should not be ashamed of the ways of God, the standards of God, even though our world may attack us for it, we should not be ashamed. And if you find yourself ashamed of any of the standards that I'm mentioning this morning, this is very serious because notice what Jesus said in Mark 8, 38. He said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father. So, if you find yourself ashamed by one of the standards of God, this is very serious. My encouragement to you today, if something like that rises up in you, to let God do a work on you today. Give it to God. Bring it to God. Make up your mind. You are not going to be ashamed of the standards that God has given us to live by. All right, so let's jump in. What are these standards? Let's start out with the Ten Commandments. You're familiar with... The Ten Commandments from Exodus 20, verses 3 through 7. And let me just go through these quickly. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I want you to notice these first uh, four commandments we could call vertical commandments because all these first four all have to do with our relationship with God. The next six we could call horizontal commandments because they all have to do with our relationships with one another. So he goes on to say, honor your father and mother, you shall not murder. Now I want to just make a little comment here. The King, <clears throat> the King James here says, thou shall not kill. So many of you grew up with that version of, of the sixth commandment. But really, a better rendering of that Hebrew word is murder. And let me just bring this uh, explanation to you. Often, God had the Israelites go to war. What happens in war? People get killed. So God would not tell people to go to war knowing they would kill people if in doing so, they were also violating his standard. So a better rendering is thou shall not murder, and we see that in the context of war, killing is not considered murder. So he says, thou shall not murder. Thou shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Now I'm going to ask a question here. Get ready, because this is a very controversial subject today, is abortion murder. We just saw in the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, but is abortion murder? And before I answer that, I realize that it's likely in a crowd this size, some of you may have had abortions. But here's what I want to remind you of. Abortion is just as forgivable by God as every other sin. And so just as I mentioned that, in, in, in fact, in these 10 commandments, we've all We've all broken probably a good chunk of those, right, before. So this is, uh, this is one we're, we're specifically looking at. But in the context of just mentioning a bunch of commandments that most of us have, have violated at some time or another in our lives. So if you have been involved in an abortion, I want to remind you that God is, is quick to forgive and to restore. And if you've asked God for forgiveness, he has forgiven you. And, and, and he has... He has, again, removed that sin, and, and he's brought you into full restoration with him. So do not, if you've, if you've had an abortion and we're looking at what does the Bible say about it, uh, do not get under uh, condemnation or shame, but be grateful for God's forgiveness, and, and maybe somebody else can be spared. Some of the challenges you've gone through as a result. Now, clearly, the Bible says you shall not murder. So really, the question about abortion, it, it really comes down to this, are the unborn human beings? Because if the unborn are human beings and they're being murdered, then, the, then abortion would be murder. Now, if we would say, well, the unborn are not human beings, 
Well, then that's, that's a whole nother question. So what we want to do, again, we're not looking to culture for our answers. In fact, I just want to remind you, I'm not, I'm not wanting to give you my opinions today. What I'm wanting to do is simply point you to here's what the Word says. Here's what the Word says. doesn't matter what my opinions are. Let's look at what the Word says. And if we're followers of Jesus, then we bring our, our beliefs, our, our practices in alignment with that. So, are the unborn considered by God human beings? That's really the question that we need to answer in order to answer the question about abortion. And as you know, this is a hot, hot topic today. Very polarizing. And uh, with, with the overturn of Roe versus Wade, it especially has escalated. And, uh, of course, we have an election coming up, and uh, that, is, that issue is believed to be a pretty major issue in terms of even who people vote for. So uh, I want to look at a couple of verses, Jeremiah 1.5, and it says this. This is God talking to the prophet Jeremiah, and he says this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nation. So, before Jeremiah was born, God considered him a you. A you is a pronoun that is applied to human beings. But notice what else he said. He said, before you were born, I ordained you a prophet. God only ordains human beings as prophets. So evidently, God considered Jeremiah a human being while in his mother's womb because he referred to him as a you, and while in his mother's womb gave him a calling he only gives to human beings. But let's look at a few more verses. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. While Jesus was in Mary's womb, the Holy Spirit uses the terminology child to describe Jesus. So the Holy Spirit calls Jesus a child before he's born, but while in his mother's womb. Matthew 1, 23, which is quoting Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. Be with child and then give birth to that child. So the question is, what is a child? Is a child a human being? I looked in the dictionary, and here's the first definition I came across. It said, a young human being below the age of puberty. That's the dictionary. A child is a young human being below the age of puberty. A child in the womb, then, is a young uh, human being and far before the age of puberty. Now, let's go to Luke 1, 15. You might say, well, okay, that was Jesus, but maybe because it was Jesus, a different terminology is used than somebody in the womb who isn't Jesus. So let's go to Luke 1, 41, and it says, and um, let me back up there. Luke 1, 15, it says, and this is an angel talking to Elizabeth about John the Baptist who was in her womb, okay? So now it's not Jesus, it's John the Baptist, and the angel, the angel says this, he, he, that's a personal pronoun applied to human beings, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So the Holy Spirit uses pronouns applied to human beings, he and his, but not only that, notice it says, the, holy, the, the, the angel said that John will be filled with the Holy Spirit even while in his mother's womb. Now in the Bible, there's only one, uh, there's only one group that, that is ever filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's human beings. Human beings. Only human beings are filled with the Holy Spirit. So if God is going to fill John with the Holy Spirit while John is in his mother's womb, evidently God does consider John a human being. Then Mary comes and greets Elizabeth, Luke 1, 41, and it says, And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. Notice before it was child, now a different word is used, babe, which is short for baby. So the babe or baby 
leaped in her womb. And then in Luke 144, it says, this is Elizabeth now responding to that. She said, for indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Only living things could leap for joy. And because the angel said John will be filled with the Holy Spirit while in his mother's womb, I am assuming that it is at that exact point when Mary brought the greeting and John the Baptist leaped in Mary's womb that it was at that point that he was filled with the Holy Spirit while in his mother's womb. And of course, joy is one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and he leaped for joy. Now, notice in both of those verses, John, while in his mother's womb, is referred to as a babe or baby. Now, write these verses down as well. I don't think they're in your notes. Luke 2, verses 12 and 16. Luke 2, verses 12 and 16. Here's Luke 2, 12. And now this is an angel talking to the shepherds about Jesus. And, and the angels said this to the shepherds. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. In other words, after Jesus is born, he also is referred to using this term babe. Verse 16, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the lying in a manger. So think, think about this. God chose to call John the Baptist while in his mother's womb the very same word, babe, that is referred to as Jesus after he is born. And yes, those are the same Greek words in both of those passages. So, it seems evident to me that God does consider the unborn as human beings. Now, we're going to switch gears here a little bit. We're still talking about biblical standards and we're going to look at the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, the Ten Commandments, those are part of the law. <clears throat> and under the New Covenant, we're no longer under the law, so, so maybe those Ten Commandments are no longer relevant. Well, that's an interesting thought, but let me just give you a couple things to think about. If that's the case, they're no longer relevant, which ones do you suppose God has changed his mind about? Like, now it is okay to lie and steal, and now it is okay to have a God before the Almighty God? I mean, which, which ones do you think he's changed his mind on? And if he has, show me the scriptures in the New Testament where he specifically told us that those commands are no longer relevant. Now, here's what I also want you to catch, is that all of the Ten Commandments except one are repeated in the New Testament, affirming that they are still God's standards that he wants us to live by. You might wonder, well, which one is not repeated in the New Testament? It's remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But even though the commandment itself is not mentioned, we see them in the Gospels observing the Sabbath, and then after the resurrection of Jesus, they began worshiping on the first day of the week. Uh, to commemorate the day he rose from the dead. And, of course, often they were meeting on a daily basis. But suppose we set the Ten Commandments aside and just looked at, well, what moral guidelines does God give us to live by in the New Testament? So let's uh, go to Galatians 5, beginning with verse 16. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the, lusts, uh, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you wish. So if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And the Holy Spirit wants you and I to be empowered by him to walk in obedience to God. Now, the only issue with that is you and I also have this thing called the flesh. And the flesh does not want to obey God. So you and I always have this battle going on, our flesh wanting us to do the wrong thing and the Holy Spirit in us wanting to do the right thing. And notice it says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
So anytime you and I give into the flesh, it means we've just stopped walking in the Spirit. What's walking in the Spirit? It is yielding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and yielding to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which gives us power to overcome the urges of the flesh. Let's go on to verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So we could... We looked at the Ten Commandments. Now here's another list, a New Testament list of thou shalt not, and they're called the works of the flesh. And they are the result of not walking in the Spirit, but they are the result of instead giving into and feeding the urges of our flesh. And as I read this list, again, we've all given in to a bunch of those, okay? But God, again, is so gracious and merciful to forgive. Now, notice what it says. The works of the flesh are evident. What does that mean? That means obvious. Now, they're not obvious to people walking in darkness. They're not obvious to people who are walking in deception. But they should be obvious to people of God. So what are these works of the flesh? Well, let's, let's read through this list. Which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. <clears throat> and the like. I'm not going to ask you how many of those have you, uh, because we, we've all failed in many of these areas. Now, notice these words, and the like. In other words, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's a whole lot of other things that could be added but the idea is now you've got a feel for what the works of the flesh are, and it should be obvious that there are some other things that would fit into that category. Now, let's keep reading. It says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past. In other words, it's good to review the standards of God. Paul, Paul is saying uh, to the Galatians, and I've told you this before, but, but you need to hear it again. You need to hear it again. And of course, uh, as people come into the kingdom of God, they need to hear the standards of God. Young people need to hear, what are the standards of God? We don't always get it the first time. We need to be reminded. And so Paul's reminding them. But then notice this. This is huge. He said, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that offends our culture. But let me point something out very carefully here. Did you notice the word practice? Practice. The, the Greek word there actually it could be translated practice habitually. Now, catch this. There's a huge, huge difference between somebody practicing these things and somebody trying to live pleasing to God, but we occasionally give into the flesh and stumble. Those are two different groups of people. This does not say if you occasionally blow it that, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This says if you practice habitually these things. And it's really about a mindset. For, so here's how this works. Those who practice these things habitually, basically they're saying these things are okay. These things are acceptable, and because they're acceptable, that is how I'm going to live. That's the kind of person who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if you and I are saying, I know these standards are God's standards, I agree with them, I am trying to live my life in alignment with them, but sometimes I fail. Sometimes I give into the flesh, and when I do, I ask God to forgive me, and he forgives me, and I move on. Now, that's a whole different mindset, because that's not one practicing these things. That is a person seeking to walk in victory over these things. Now let's keep reading verse 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is. So when we give into the urges of the flesh, those are the kinds of things that, that happen, or those are some of the ways we live. But what happens if instead of giving into those things, what if we are led by the Spirit? Then how will we live? Here's the things the Holy Spirit wants to produce in you and I. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
If those things are not things you're practicing, then it means you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in you. And notice the last fruit mentioned is self-control. The Holy Spirit wants to give you and I enough self-control to say no to the works of the flesh. And notice this last part, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you and I belong to Jesus, we have an obligation to learn to say no to the flesh, to quit feeding the flesh, and instead to nurture our walking in the Holy Spirit so we can bear the fruit of the Spirit instead of the works of the flesh. Now let's shift to another question, and really we've answered this question already, but we're going to specifically focus on it for a few moments. Is premarital sex morally acceptable? Now, why am I bringing this up? Because according to the survey I've been referencing, 68% of self-professed Christians say premarital sex is morally acceptable. 68%. Of people who say they are Christians, say that premarital sex is morally acceptable. So I don't really care what their opinion is or what culture's opinion is. What I want to know is what does God's word say? And as we answer that, we need to not only uh, address this issue, but we, we need to address both adultery and fornication and what they both mean and what God's word says. Now, as I mentioned, really, We've already answered the question. Remember the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. We, we already looked at that. What is adultery? Well, I think you all know, but just to make sure, adultery is when a married person has sex with somebody other than his or her spouse. Pretty, pretty clear. And God says, no, don't, don't do that. Do not do that. And then we also saw... From the New Testament, Galatians 5.19, we already read it, but let's look at it again. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Now, again, we listed a whole bunch of other stuff, so, so this is not, like, different than this whole other list of things. Maybe you've not sinned in this area, but we've all sinned somewhere in that huge list. But we've, we've defined adultery. What is fornication? Well, fornication would be sex between two people who are not married to each other. And remember what the 21st verse says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, practice. Say it's okay. Give yourself to it intentionally over and over. Again, that's a big difference from somebody who acknowledges the standards of God is trying to live in alignment with them, but occasionally fails. Now, what did Jesus himself say about this subject? Well, let's go to... <clears throat> Matthew 5, 27 and 28, and Jesus said this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, he's quoting what we just read. What's he going to say about it now? Is he going to say, but, but, uh, no, you don't have to worry about that anymore, or is he going to affirm it? Well, let's see what he says. He says, but I say to you <clears throat> that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow, he not only affirms the standard, but he raises the bar higher. He's saying adultery is still sin, but, but, but under the new covenant, we're going to even take this further because we're not just going to look at the letter of the law. We're going to look at the spirit of the law. And, and the spirit of it is if you look upon a woman to lust after her, even though you have not committed the physical act of adultery, you've committed adultery in the heart. And I believe what he's actually saying there it would probably be if you would have had the opportunity to do it physically, you would have, because you already did it in your heart. Now, I want you to notice those words, looks to lust. That's what it says, looks to lust. There is a look that is not to lust, and then there is a look to lust. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, is there a better definition for pornography than that? Look to lust. Why would anybody look at pornography only to lust? What, what other reason would there be? And so I believe Jesus is not only affirming that adultery is still wrong, but he's also saying, don't, don't get messed up in looking to lust even, even if it's 
pornography or, or somebody that you see. Now, having said that, I want to go to a, a, a powerful story in John 8. So a woman is caught in adultery. They, they bring her to Jesus, and they're basically saying, hey, according to the law, she should be stoned. So what are we going to do with her? And, of course, they're setting him up. And I've, I've always been intrigued by adultery takes two. Where's the man? Where's the man? Why'd he get off the hook? He should have been brought there as well. But we hear nothing about the man, just the woman. So they're, they're wondering, what's Jesus going to do here? And, G, and I'm kind of abbreviating the story, but Jesus basically says to the crowd, well, okay, the, yeah, the, the law says to stone her, so let's do it this way. Whoever has never sinned, why don't you pick up and throw the first stone? So, as you probably know the story, they all start walking away until they're all gone, except her and Jesus. And she sa- Jesus says to her, so, uh, where are your accusers? Where, where are those who condemn you? And she said, there are none, Lord. And then he says this powerful, powerful sentence. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And you got to put those two together. Neither do I condemn you. Do you realize John 3, 17 says God, or Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved? Oh, there are consequences for sin, and there is a final judgment, but the heart of God is to forgive us before we get there. The heart of God is to forgive us no matter what sins we've committed. And so he wasn't condemning her. He sensed in her heart there was a repentance there, but notice what else he said right after that, go and sin no more. In other words, he was saying, yes, you have sinned, but I sense your repentant heart, so I don't condemn you, but now go live differently. Don't go back to that. That's not what God has for you. And that's what God says to you and I today, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. One of the things we notice under the new covenant is there's a stronger grace and mercy attached to God's standards are the same, but it's so much easier to experience the forgiveness and the restoration to God because of what Jesus did for us. Paul, uh, I'm not going to read it all because of time, but Paul said a couple of amazing things in Romans 3, 8 through 10, and, and you'll see it right here. He quotes like five, half of the commandments again. So again, he's affirming that these are still valid. He quotes them, uh, the the vertical ones, the ones that, uh, or pardon me, the horizontal ones, the ones that have to do with our relationships with others. But then he makes this statement saying that all these commandments are summed up in this one saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself because love does no harm to your neighbor. So the greater focus in the New Testament than the ten thou shalt nots is the one thou shalt, which is love your neighbor. And, and one of the things he's saying here, and this is, this is really amazing, he's saying, when you're loving your neighbor, you will not sin against your neighbor because that's not what love does. In other words, if you had never heard of any of the Ten Commandments, but you were loving your neighbor, you would never break any of those commandments. Because love does no harm to our neighbor. So the greater focus than thou shalt not is focus on growing in your love for God and love for others. And as you love others, you will be obeying those commandments. Okay, we're going to look at two other things real quickly. The third thing here is did Jesus literally raise from the dead? And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because A biblical worldview and your salvation depend upon your believing this to be the case. Now, you've all heard lots of Easter messages, so I'm not going to really take much time at all, hardly on this, so just a few quick comments. Each of the Gospels at the end shows us stories of his resurrection appearing to different people at different times, different places. And not only that, but Jesus himself predicted he would rise from the dead. And you have the scriptures there in your notes. So if he hadn't risen from the dead, literally, then those scriptures would be untrue and the Bible would contain lies. But in the early church, after he ascended into heaven, 
His resurrection from the dead is one of the main things they preached. Now, just before he ascended into heaven, Acts 1-3 says this, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he rose from the dead. There was a 40-day period before he ascended into heaven. There were numerous appearances before groups of people in that 40-day period. And it says he proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that he had risen from the dead. Many infallible proofs. In other words, by the time he ascended into heaven, they had no doubts. Now think about it. If they did have doubts, why would they risk their lives? Why would they risk their lives if they weren't convinced he had risen from the dead? And as we see through church history, probably several of the apostles were martyred for their faith. They would not have been willing to do that apart from being convinced of his resurrection. Acts 4.33, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In other words, as they preached the resurrection, God confirmed that message by doing miracles. Acts 17, 31, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In other words, the gospel that Paul was preaching, God affirmed that by raising Jesus from the dead. And I'm not going to read these next several verses, but uh, I mentioned Jesus was alive for 40 days. And what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 15 here is he gives the number of people that saw him during those 40 days. That was just to make sure you're awake and alert for the, for the last few minutes of the message, all right? And, and one of the things Paul said is that at one point, over 500 people saw Jesus at once, and most of them were still alive. In other words, they would have called Paul on it if he wasn't telling them the truth. All right, I want to, I want to close with one other question. Does the Bible teach equity? Wow. Maybe we better just close here. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because we are bombarded with an equity ideology today. And so whenever we're bombarded with something in culture, we need to say, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? Now, whether or not the Bible teaches equity really depends on how you define equity. Okay, how you define it. I looked up equity in the dictionary, and here's what it said. The quality of being fair and impartial. If that's how we define equity, the Bible teaches equity. The Bible teaches the quality of being fair and impartial. So the Bible teaches an equity that is in alignment with that definition. And what our culture is doing is it's getting part of it right and part of it wrong. And what our culture has done in addition to that definition or added to that definition is also added an artificially forced equal outcomes. The Bible teaches that all should have equal opportunities while not teaching there should be equal forced outcomes. And we're going to just touch on that for a couple minutes, then we'll close. The Bible does teach equity or equality in terms of the value of every human being. Aren't you glad that, that no matter who you are, God loves you as much as anybody? Aren't you glad that your age doesn't matter, your, your height, your looks don't matter to God? Aren't you grateful that whether you're young, old, rich, poor, no matter what your skin color is, that, that we all come to God on a level playing field? And, and that's what true equity and equality is. And, and, and the Bible says, whosoever will may come. I'm so glad the invitation is to every one of us and, and, and that n nothing about who we are disqualifies us from coming to the Lord. Here's a couple of scriptures. God shows no partiality, and I'm so grateful for that. Acts 10, 34. There is no partiality with God, Romans 2, 11. God shows personal favoritism to no one. And here's an interesting verse, 1 Peter 117, it says, the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Notice the first part, without partiality. Again, we all come in the same playing field. It's a level playing field. But, but, notice the last part, he judges according to each one's work. 
What does that mean? That means the outcomes are not the same. It means one person may be awarded more if their works are more. There would be no reason whatsoever for God to judge each one according to the works if the outcomes were going to all be the same. Now, let's look at another verse. So if God shows no partiality and you and I are godly, then we should show no partiality. And there's a couple of verses here. First uh, Timothy 5.21, it says... I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. So that's how God wants you and I to roll in this world, that just like God, we don't show prejudice, we don't show partiality, we, we, we treat every person with respect and dignity, even when they don't agree with us, even when they maybe don't treat us well. And then he says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convic convicted by the laws as transgressors. I want to, just a couple more minutes and then we'll close. The parable of the stewards. And, and this parable is powerful because it, it gives us what a kingdom ideology looks like versus some of the ideology that we are bombarded with in our culture. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, so this is how kingdom stuff works. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Now, remember, this story is actually about the kingdom. So this owner who has given three stewards different amounts of money to steward, it really represents Christ who's gone to heaven and he's given you and I what we have to steward. And one day he's coming back. We just saw it. He's going to judge each one according to his works. One day he's coming back to see what did we do with what we were given. Now, I want you to notice all three had an opportunity to do something significant. But we also notice he gave each one according to his own ability. That doesn't sound like equity. He gave one five, one two, and one one. But it was fair because he was rewarding them according to their previous works. So he gives them all an opportunity, but to the ones who have been more faithful, he gives them more to steward. So he goes away, he comes back, and then he's going to settle accounts, and the one who had five talents doubled, now he had ten, these are amounts of money, the one who had two talents doubled his, so now he had four, and the third one, well, we'll look at him in a moment, he didn't do anything with his except bury it. So here's what happened to the first two. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a uh, few. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He said the exact same thing to both of them. In other words, their faithfulness was rewarded with increase. Well, then, what about the third one? What happened there? His Lord said to him, "You wicked and lazy servant. Therefore, take the talent from him." And give it to who? To the one who has 10. That does not sound like equity. Think about it. If the one who had five doubled his, we've got 10. If the one who had two doubled his, that's four. 10 plus four is 14. And then the guy who did nothing with his, he still had it. There's 15. 15 talents. That's really easy to divide by three, isn't it? Five each. Can you imagine the owner said, well, you know, it's just not right for you to have 10 and you to have one. That's just not fair. That's just too big a gap between the haves and the have-nots. So we're going to take five. He'll still have the five he was given. We're going to take one. We're going to, and all will have five. Did he do that? No, he actually did the opposite of that. He took from the one who didn't have and actually gave to the one who had the most. And that may be like, well, I, don't, I don't understand it, but that's, that's how the kingdom works. And we'll close with this verse. Here's what he says. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, faithfulness is rewarded, unfaithfulness brings a discipline. And, and the way our culture has taken this, it's actually basically saying in this story, what our culture would have done is taken, <laughs> taken the five and given it to the one who is unfaithful, rewarding the unfaithfulness. But that's not, have you noticed life doesn't work that way? Life does not work that way. 
And really, that's more of a socialism thinking. But do you realize socialism has never resulted in a higher standard of living for the masses? That kind of thinking has never once throughout history resulted in a higher standard of living for the masses, just a higher standard of living for those at the top. And I wanna, I'm going to close with, with just a, a simple um, illustration here. Um, suppose you are a salesperson and that most of your salary is commission. And suppose you're in a company with several salespeople and suppose you are the best salesperson in the company, which means you make more money than the other salesmen. But you're good. Not only are you good, you work really hard. But suppose the owner of the company has been giving in to some of the, the, the equity ideology. And he says, you know, there's just, there's just too much a gap between, between your income and the income of the the, the, bot, the person who's at the bottom of the, of the sales. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all the commissions and put them in one pot, and then we're going to divide them equally amongst the salespeople. Now, that'd be great if you're at the bottom, right? <laughs> but if you're at the top, it's really stealing. And, and that kind of thinking, what it actually does is it robs people from motivation and of their dignity. And it doesn't cause the person who's not being a good steward, to be held accountable for where they're at. Now, if that's what happened and you're the top salesperson, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to work as hard. Why should you? And everybody's going to make less. All right, well, let's, let's stand and uh, as we bring the message to a close and the whole series to a close. Uh, I'm going to ask the prayer teams that are serving today, uh, you can come as we get ready to close. But it is so important that you and I have a biblical worldview. And, and maybe some of your beliefs, some of your behaviors have been challenged in this series. That's okay. The important thing is that we are committed to living according to God's standards, even when it hurts, even when culture maybe criticizes us. God wants you and I to hold to his standards in how we live, but I do want to remind you what is so important is that when others don't agree, when others don't live that way, that we still love them, that we still treat them with respect. Remember, the world hasn't agreed to follow God's ways. Sinners are going to sin. What they don't need primarily is to stop sinning. What they do need is to turn to Jesus. That's what they need. So be careful how you uh, deal with other people who don't agree with your standards, who attack you for your standards, but... Be courageous in walking out the standards that God has given you. So as I close, I'm just going to ask God to show each of us, is there any changes that we may need to make in adjusting our views, our standards, or something about our life? And after uh, the prayer, you may go. But if you're staying for lunch, we'd love to have you stay uh, for a little bit and just hang out with the church body here and uh, just enjoy a meal together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that even though culture has moved further and further away, your ways have not changed. And life works far better when we follow your ways. And I pray that you will empower each one of us to live our lives authentically in a, in a culture that is walking in darkness. May our lights shine, and may we be known above all else, not only as people who walk with integrity, but also people who love with the love of God. So Lord, help us to hold to our standards, but to do so lovingly, respectfully. And Lord, if there's any changes we need to make in our views or how we're living to be more in alignment with your ways, your truth, then may the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth and empower us to walk out your ways. And God, I thank you that even though there's a whole list of things where we've all failed, I thank you that you are so merciful, so full of grace, that if we just ask you to forgive us, you are quick to forgive us and to restore us to right relationship with you and to bring healing into our lives. And so once again, cover us with the blood of Jesus. Wash us clean. And may we live as lights shining in a dark world. 
for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray and I speak over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord give you his peace. And uh, so you're welcome to go if you need to slip out. Otherwise, again, we'd love to have you stay. I'm not sure what the directions will be for the meal, uh, but look forward to fellowshipping with you. God bless you. And again, if you want prayer, we have some amazing people up here.